timer on there. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for welcoming me back to Kevin's song to continue our discussion about men and suicide. I think it might be the fourth time um, that I've been here, so I like to consider myself a lifer. I hope I'll be invited back. Um, so uh, Brian and I are going to present on two different initiatives, and uh, originally we thought Brian might go first to kind of frame zero suicide, um, but we were okay swapping as to whoever slides came up first. And um, I see my study actually uh, relating more to how we get people to the services that are really focused, like what you're going to hear about from Dr. Amadani with Henry Ford and Zero Suicide. So I tend to focus my work as a social worker on public health social work initiatives and really trying to think about what practices work or could possibly work in communities to reach out to populations that I know for myself as a clinical social worker, I just really haven't had much luck reaching. So today we're going to talk about an online screening intervention, and I'm going to share some preliminary research findings with you. I have about three hours of slides to share with you, and I think I have um, 20 minutes, so we'll see how we do. Uh, I need to thank the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for their generous support of this randomized controlled trial, and um, also this was a, a multi-state, uh, multi-person, multi-organization effort to develop Healthy Men Michigan. And really, we would not be successful without the special thank you at the bottom of this slide to our over 230 organizational partners throughout Michigan that really served as boots on the ground to make this happen. So I am humbled to be here to present some of the first preliminary findings with all of you, many of whom have been such an incredible part of this initiative and continue to take on um, the task, uh, the challenges, and also um, the gratitude and the hope of being able to reach out to men in the community who are often struggling in silence. Let me ask really quickly, how many of you have heard of man therapy? Okay. Well, I have a short video. Um, I don't know that we're going to have time to show that. We'll see maybe at the end. But that's the intervention that we're testing here. And so one of the challenges in um, my research is thinking about how do we reach out to middle-aged men, which we've expanded to working-aged men. and. Um, this is from the Suicide uh, Research Prevention Center that really provides some nice guidelines that came out a couple years ago with actionable steps. And one of the biggest takeaways is that if we don't focus and hone in on men who are dying at increasing risk rates of suicide, we're not actually going to be able to move the needle in terms of reducing the overall death rate in the U.S. So there are some unique suicide risk factors for men. Um, we think about depression as an important risk factor, but actually the CDC data on death um, studies shows us that only about 40% of men who died by suicide in working age um, population had a known uh, mental health condition. And of those that did have a mental health condition, depression or other, only about 25 were actually in treatment. So again, this kind of feeds back into, as a clinician, and I've worked at NASA and the Department of Energy and a lot of other Federal Aviation Administration I've consulted with, a lot of organizations that are male dominated, there's something going on with a disconnect through mental health services um, that we're not reaching a lot of the men that are at increased risk. So a couple risk factors that we try to hone in on, um, as well as some occupational risks. Now some of you may have seen just yesterday, the CDC came out with a new study on occupational risks and suicide. Um, when you look at ages 16 to 64, over the past two decades, there's been a 40% increase in suicide death with this age group. And there are some implications for which areas and industries that folks work in. Um, I'd be happy to uh, link you to that study, or you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook, and we've posted it. But some of the five top industry groups for suicide death with working aged men and women are, one, mining, quarrying, oil and gas extraction, particularly for men. Two, construction, again, for particularly for men. Other services, like automotive services, 
agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting, again with men, and transportation and warehousing with significant higher rates for men and women over the overall population. So when we think about Michigan, a lot of those occupations and industries are present in all parts of the state. And so when we did this study, we really tried to think about how could we reach men to test a new intervention that would build and take off from the stereotypes that we think about as oftentimes being barriers to help seeking for men, to be able to engage them in talking about help seeking and their suicide risk, but also target places in the community, including workplaces, where we know risks might be higher. So that really brings us to the birth of Healthy Men Michigan, which the first year that um, the Ursos invited me to come here was to lay the groundwork. To, you know, I'm in Maryland. This is an online intervention. So we needed to have folks like yourself and your organizations that got it or could help us spread the word that suicide prevention is part of everyone's mission and business. And so behind this site, now if, you, if you're online right now and you go to it, it's not live anymore. The study has concluded collecting data and we're finalizing our data collection. But we are trying to test out the effectiveness of this guy. So those of you that know man therapy, or you can go later to mantherapy.org, Dr. Rich Mahogany is a fictitious doctor that talks to men online. He was developed out of Colorado from feedback of mostly rural, mostly white men in working age of what would get them to talk about their mental health and their suicide risk. And there were certain things they wanted. They wanted stories of hope and recovery. They wanted to hear stories of resiliency. They wanted tools to help themselves. They did not always want to go to counseling or be referred to a lifeline or helpline. And they also wanted an intervention to be funny. So uh, I did not create man therapy, and I actually went into this study with a healthy dose of skepticism, um, which is good for any researcher to have. But what we're finding is that Rich Mahogany is super popular. But what we didn't know is, does he actually make a difference? And could he potentially be harmful? So he was engaging a lot of men to take self-assessment, to think about their risk. And this was the first study um, to actually show does a something like man therapy actually make a difference in reducing suicide risk, depression, and we also looked at anger. So again, I encourage you to take a peek at mantherapy.org. Um, it was developed out of Colorado from Cactus, uh, which is a marketing communications company that does the licensing for man therapy in collaboration with the Colorado Suicide uh, Prevention Office and Dr. Sally Spencer Thomas, who many of you have known has been here to speak. So let me jump into um, let's see. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on the campaign because I think that's very interesting in terms of those results, and then I'll share some of our preliminary findings. Make sure the timer is going forward and not backwards. All right, we're good. Um, so, we oops, we started by reaching out in Michigan to our peers, the health and mental health professionals. They got it. A lot of them were funded throughout the state. Many of your organizations are represented, working with kids on a GLS grant and had state coalitions, working with Pat Smith and other folks. And even though the mission was maybe focused on youth, a lot of the practitioners and suicide advocates and researchers saw that there was a need for parents, for the soccer coaches, for the professionals themselves. So they were willing to do something about suicide prevention. They just didn't have necessarily the resources. And so then we also um, said, well, that's a great place to start, but we need to go further if we're going to really connect with men that aren't traditionally connected to health and mental health services. So we reached out to education, public safety, emergency groups, but the third um, circle over here was our most exciting place to really try to do a mental health, public health, suicide prevention campaign, where we looked at businesses and high-risk industries, faith-based organizations, casinos, barber shops, social clubs, fitness centers, you name it. So I had quite a team that would go out and do letter writing, we would make calls, we would um, you know, do different types of advertising, high-tech and low-tech, and where we recruited really over 8,000 people over the course of two and a half years came to Healthy Men Michigan to do screening, men and women, um, young and old, and 25% uh, of them came from the green circle, our traditional group, 10% came from our middle circle, and 40% came from the purple circle. 
which we were very excited. And it was um, touch and go a little bit in terms of were we going to make this work. The first year that we started this campaign, we used a lot of mental health language and wording, and that wasn't resonating with our population. So we really needed to change how we were talking about um, connecting to folks to come to Healthy Men Michigan. So we did a lot of different strategies, and some of you were involved, and I thank you so much for that. Um, working with Eric Hippel, retired, um, a former quarterback of the Lions. We did some TV shows. One day I had a bunch of my guy friends say, Jody, I was watching, like woke up to watch stuff on the draft and you were on there talking on a sports show Sunday morning about suicide, like what in the world? Um, so I really had to get out of my comfort zone in terms of who I spoke to as a researcher and a clinician. Uh, we also did quite a bit of marketing with our partners. You can see the billboard at the bottom of this slide was donated space from Lapeer County Community Health. Um, we also worked with uh, the previous governor, Rick Snyder, to do a proclamation day for June 25th for men's mental health awareness. And then uh, you can see um, Gail and John are in the picture. So also the high touch made a difference in terms of being able to go out in the community to health and wellness events and to distribute materials, all to get people to come to Healthy Men Michigan. And we used quite a bit of social media. So I had to listen to my partners at Cactus. I, I didn't believe that men between the ages of 25 and 64 were on Facebook and Instagram, but they were. And that's where we did a lot of our recruiting. So we were able to really carefully watch our Google Analytics to see how some of these strategies that blended some parts of man therapy, but kind of, we used to call it rich mahogany uh, light because we were testing that intervention behind the scenes. So let me quickly share a couple of the preliminary results because they're pretty exciting. And let me just say that over the next couple of months, we're frantically writing articles to get this information out because we think it's really important. So I've got a couple, I'm good, right? Is that, so I have like seven minutes. All right, I'm getting confused. The clock's going backwards. I thought it was going forward. Okay, so Healthy Men Michigan was live for about two and a half years. And again, our primary outcomes that we were looking at were suicide, depression, and then we also built in anger. And I'm gonna talk specifically about anger if I have a couple minutes um, in a little bit. One of the things that we did, so let me explain for a minute how it worked. People would come to healthymenmichigan.org and they were invited to take a free anonymous screening that was built on a basic depression platform. Some of you may have used National Depression Screening Day. So that was our partner and we worked on that to integrate and build on the depression screening, which was the Harvard National Screening Day scale, um, a suicide. Uh, screening tool, which is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. So that was number one that hadn't really been done. Um, and so that was interesting and challenging, but also exciting to be able to put that onto an online platform. We also then added a DSM single item uh, indicator for anger because most of our depression indices don't tap into how men experience and or report depression. And a lot of masculinity theory talks about men experiencing depression differently, perhaps than how the CESD or the PHQ, how they've been normed and developed mostly with women. So we, needed, we felt we needed to look at anger and I'm, I'm glad we did. There's other aspects as well of um, male depression to consider, but we tapped into those differently. So, over the course of two and a half years, um, we actually, with your help, did a great job of recruiting over 2,000 men living in Michigan between the ages of 25 and 64. And while this was a randomized controlled trial, so if somebody was in that demographic and they were at moderate or high risk for depression, if they were at risk for suicide, and if they had moderate or high levels of anger, they were then invited to be in the study. And if they were invited into the study, it all happened online, they would do the informed consent and they were randomly assigned to one of two groups. The first group received their results on that screening and referrals to services. The second group received that plus we asked them to look at man therapy. And then over the course of three months, we did some follow-up assessments to see, did it help? What was their suicide um, risk level? What was their depression looking like? And what was their help seeking like? We also tapped into a lot of different uh, indicators like substance use, um, burdensomeness, isolation, social support, um, alcohol, uh, drug use, which are not our primary outcomes, but we have data on that. 
So our study sample was actually fairly representative of Michigan. We compared it to the census and we tried as much as we could to represent men um, between the ages of 25 and 64, to look at issues related to race and ethnicity, and also to look at geography. We wanted to make sure our partners in the UP had the resources they needed maybe to tap into industries like mining, just like we worked with other groups um, in uh, Detroit, in, in Flint, in Wayne, um, all over Michigan to recruit men anywhere they might be in the community. So these are the takeaways in terms of some of the big findings. And again, there's a lot of data. Um, so I mentioned we had over 2,000 men in the demographic, and of those um, men, 554 agreed to be in our study. So we ended up with a nice, robust sample um, that we're able to examine. Well, let me go back to this slide. So over time, we found both groups statistically improved on our primary outcomes of suicide, depression, and anger. Man therapy, I'll tap into a little bit, um, started off a little bit worse, actually, just uh, by no fault of our own, the randomization um, you know, doesn't make any preference. And so we did find some additional reductions in scores for men in our man therapy group, but by the end of the three months, men in the depression only um, platform and men in a man therapy both statistically improved over time for suicide risk, for depression, and for anger. That's a huge takeaway for public health interventions. This is a very cost-effective online program that's actually making a difference in reducing risk. And even National Depression Screening Day, which never has been evaluated amongst this population with men, is also showing significant results. Men in our man therapy group had greater changes in their scores for some of the risk predictors, particularly social support um, and decreasing some of the structural barriers. So when you think about like the stigma and the issues we talked about of access to care, a lot of men in our study actually didn't know that there was care available. So there's still basic mental health literacy that still needs to be done in the community and also reducing psychological aggression over time. Another interesting result, so I've presented on man therapy um, for several years now, and I'm always asked, you know, this was an intervention primarily designed for white rural men in, Cal in Colorado. How does it work for men of color? How does it work for men who maybe don't prescribe to traditional stereotypical masculinity um, theories? And so we actually looked at these groups separately. About 20% of our population identified as a man of color. And in our sample, that was made up of um, African American and Latino. Uh, we also looked at men who identified as gay, bisexual, queer. Uh, again, you had to identify as male to be in our study. So that doesn't mean that we didn't have trans men in our study. It just was not something that was asked. Um, for both of these groups, Again, I had a healthy dose of skepticism in terms of what man therapy may or may not be able to do. We found improvements in looking at both groups for man therapy on different factors for suicide and depression, both for our men of color as compared to men of color in the control group and for our men that identified as gay, bisexual, queer. We don't know exactly what it is about this uh, intervention that's causing a reduction in suicide risk, so I do have a grant under review. To, I have an opportunity to call the men and interview them about what was it that encouraged you to do the, um, do the online intervention, what was it that helped to decrease your risk of suicide, and what were the limitations of it so that we can improve something like this in the future. And the last takeaway I'll mention is anger. I only have a, one more minute and like 100 slides to share with you. Um, thanks, Brian. <laughs> Brian was on the grant, so he kept me in check with some of this stuff. Um, let me show you this. We, I won't uh, bore you with the logistic regression, but one of the interesting pieces of the sample of 2,000 men that we screened initially, uh, we were able to look at, well, what was the influence of anger on suicide risk? And for 12% of the men in that group, they did not report any symptoms of depression, but they presented with suicide risk and anger. So masculinity theory for a long time has been publishing conceptual papers without having large databases to support this. So this is one of the first studies with a large sample to actually look at the correlation between anger and suicide, absence of depression. Now let me say, because Thomas Joyner is also on the grant, I think he's gone, but he has pointed out, now Jody, that doesn't mean that depression is not important. And depression was 
eight times more predictive of having a suicide uh, risk indicator as well. But the, the biggest piece is the 12% of our men that did not have depression that were at risk for suicide. So if you're in a community setting where you're using the PHQ-8, where the ninth question isn't asked unless you're um, at positive for depression, or you're not asking about suicide unless you're positive for depression, we're potentially missing 12% of the men ages 25 to 64. So let me just conclude. Um, I had a couple quotes up here. I think one of the other important takeaways to peek at is the help seeking. So for both the Healthy Men Michigan control group and also the man therapy group, we can find that men, after viewing a number of the resources, they actually at about 50% thought that they were willing to seek for more formal mental health treatment, either very likely or somewhat likely. So in terms of moving um, to the next step of help seeking, this is very encouraging because most of these men were not connected with any kind of health or mental health services. So we're doing a lot of other analytical models and a qualitative study, um, but let me just end with a, a quote in terms of thinking about man therapy. Man therapy opened up a whole new world I never even thought of for self-help, working through stuff at home rather than constant having to shuffle to the counselor's office every um, week. This was really important, and even for men that were in treatment, they told us in interviews that they used it in between their therapy sessions as a booster session almost. So that was kind of an unexpected result. I really saw this as a way to connect and bring people into formal and informal treatment. But even for folks that are in treatment, it had an additional benefit. So implications in thinking about next steps. Number one, I think it's great that we were able to have success working with the community to encourage men, a difficult to reach population, to use a public health approach like Healthy Men Michigan and man therapy. Um, I think it was exciting to be able to have men use this online platform where they could get immediate help, uh, but also to think about their own risk in a safe space. And I think that it's interesting to look at how something like man therapy that uses humor, that taps into some of the stereotypes that we think of as barriers to help seeking as a way to maybe reverse the conversation, engage men in thinking about um, their risk and seeking help. So I, I will leave us with, um, we really need to think about this. You know, when I think about back to being a clinician and training students, if we're going to encourage men to come forward more and more and talk about their feelings, we need to be ready to listen. And that's a whole nother presentation that I think the conference needs to have is about the scripts we use in therapy when we work with men. So a lot of us as clinicians and practitioners aren't ready to hear it. And think about also for those of you in the workplace, if we're thinking about anger as an indicator of suicide risk, what kind of empathy feelings do you have for your angry coworker or boss? Not a lot of warm and fuzzy like we do for someone that's sad and withdrawn. The person that's angry is often getting in trouble, they're seen as a bully, but maybe we need to reframe what's going on if that's an expression of depression and think about, you know, like Mike Anesta said, if we're just gonna turn people off, we're not gonna get anywhere in this conversation. So how can we maybe think about who we're meeting with and how we can be there for them? So I'm gonna end, um, again, I think the possibility of not just preventing suicide, but making life worth living is really critical to think about these innovative online interventions that take a public health approach to increase connectivity, to increase help seeking, and to help build um, more of a, a collaborative space where there's a quality of life. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. All right. How's everyone doing? Yes, people responded, that's good. <laughs> uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, our zero suicide program. If we can get the slides up. We've been implementing a program uh, similar to the one that we've rolled out at Henry Ford on zero suicide across multiple healthcare systems around the country and we've been measuring it. So I want to talk a little bit about that, give you a little context of where we started. But first of all, I just want to say thank you to John and Gail Urso. This is an incredible event. 
Uh, I can remember the first one several years ago, and to think that we would be sold out four years later, having to turn people away uh, with over 400 and some people here, and potentially millions of people streaming across the world, live to this room, uh, to think that we've built this, that they've built this in this community is absolutely amazing. So I want to first of all say thank you for that. Okay, so we, we, I'm going to try and go about 20 minutes and then give you all a chance to ask a, a few questions and, and then we'll talk a little bit more. So this is, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Brian Amadani from Henry Ford Health System. Uh, I am our director of the Center for Health Policy and Health Services Research, also the director of research for behavioral health services, uh, and uh, am a licensed uh, social worker, and have a lot of different hats in this ring, uh, and, one, and, I, and a lot of passion to trying to figure out the best ways to prevent suicide, not just for a small group of people, for, but globally across our nation and across our, our world. This is... Uh, an incredible project that was funded by the National Institute of Health. We're about halfway through right now. Well, not quite halfway through, but we're about almost halfway through. And I want to thank uh, the support of the, the National Institute of Mental Health, but also of our collaboration across the country with the Mental Health Research Network, which has supported a lot of this multi-site research to allow us to touch millions of people at the same time in an, in an effort to try and prevent suicide at a large scale to see if the things that we're trying at all of our different healthcare systems actually can work to prevent suicide attempts. So I want to give you a little context. A few years ago, so I've presented at, at a few of these uh, meetings, but I want to give you a little context for some of you who weren't here. Henry Ford in 2001 implemented a program that is famously, was famously called Perfect Depression Care. And it included a whole bunch of elements that really just were designed to provide better care for the people that we were providing services to. So we wanted to do the right thing. There really wasn't a lot of evidence to support any type of intervention 20 years ago. We've made incredible strides since then. I believe that we are making massive impact and massive progress in suicide prevention right now. We have a long way to go, and it's going to take all of us to work together. The reason that we did this project was to try and figure out ways to give you the tools to, to inform your decision making and to figure out how to best implement these strategies and how to work them together so that we can prevent suicide on a large scale, not just in one local community, uh, but, but across our nation. Uh, so our program, when we implemented all these different types of interventions, we really weren't sure which one of those interventions actually made the difference. Uh, in fact, after implementing those, we did see a decrease in about 75 to 80% of, of the suicide rate in our behavioral health patient population which is uh, one of the uh, biggest reductions ever seen in the history of the world in a singular, in a singular healthcare system. Uh, that created a lot of movement and momentum nationally when we kind of came out with those results. Those results were put into the National Action Alliance's National Strategy on Suicide Prevention in 2012. And the country made a declaration that we were going to, together, strive for zero suicide. Coupled with that, a research prioritization task force was developed to set up a series of research priorities that our country needed to focus on in order to better figure out how to prevent suicide at a large scale, both in your community and uh, at the population level. So SAMHSA, to, took the information from that uh, report, funded some tools and resources to be developed through the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. Healthcare systems started implementing those tools across the country. And to this day, 
we have literally had hundreds of healthcare systems beginning to implement those tools in their local areas, including many of you who are here today, as I've talked with many of you who are doing these incredible things. We have an international movement where now almost 20 countries around the world have signed on to implement these principles into their national healthcare systems to try and prevent suicide at an even greater level. We've made incredible progress, but we have a long way to go. And that's why we're all here today, because all of us have the passion, the motivation, and the ability to make a change together to move forward to prevent suicide for our next generation. We can't prevent what has already happened, but we can always learn from what has already happened so that we can strive to prevent the next thing from happening, the next person from dying, the next person from attempting. And that's why we're all here today. So we launched a across our mental health research network, a multi-site evaluation of the decisions that all of these healthcare systems are making about implementing zero suicide. So, you know, when we first launched our, our initiative, it's funny because we, we first launched it and we got a lot of attention. People were flying in from all over the world. Hey, how did you do this? And we were describing uh, I remember sitting in some of these meetings, we were describing how we did the things that we did uh, and all the people that were involved. And, and to quote Dr. Seuss, the, the, the reaction was, well, we can't do that in our box or with our fox, and we can't do that in our, with our mouse or especially in our house. We can't do that because we don't have the things that you have. And I heard so many excuses. Well, we can't do this because we don't have this, and we don't have that, and we don't have this, and there's no way we could ever do it. The reality is, is we didn't have those things either. And I think that the reality is, is we can do it, but we have to find a way to do it using the systems that we have in place. Amazingly, since that time, hundreds of healthcare systems have declared that they are going to try. And most of that has happened within the last couple years. The very first national academy to teach people how to, to implement zero suicide happened in 2015, and there were only 15 healthcare systems there. Most of the people that have started doing this have started within the last couple years. But we have spread this to hundreds of places across the country just in that time. But, the questions that we now get are, how do you do it? What, where do I start? What are the best places to, to start? What are the best settings to start in? Who are the best providers to use? What are the best interventions to implement first? Because we can't afford to do all these things at once. How do we start? How do we do this and this and this? We needed some, some evidence. And we needed to gather that from healthcare systems that were implementing and making their own decisions across, across the country in their own ways. So we did this, uh, launched this initiative uh, called our, our, our National Zero Suicide Evaluation. We are implementing zero suicide components, which include a, a, an array of different uh, implementation activities and interventions, and I'll show you those in a minute across six healthcare systems, obviously Henry Ford uh, in Detroit here, um, in Kaiser Permanente in Washington State, uh, Kaiser in Northwest, which covers the state of Oregon, Southern California, Northern California, and the state of Colorado. We also have strong collaboration from the federal government who's been really involved in helping us think through some of the questions and also to uh, help implement uh, some of this, these activities in a really meaningful way. So what are we challenged to do? Uh, so the first thing we wanted to do is work with our health system partners to figure out what are you actually doing? Because the systems were making the decisions and we purposely set it up that way. It would not be the same evaluation 
if we did a randomized trial with 9 million people across the country, first of all, we never could afford that per year. Uh, but second of all, that wouldn't be reflective of the real world. One of the interesting findings uh, in, that, in that research prioritization task force is that we really needed real world evidence. What was happening in a controlled clinical trial environment where all of the factors are excluded, it didn't replicate or reflect the real world. And so when some of that information got translated into the real world, people had challenges. There were barriers to be encountered. How do we pay for this? Who does it? You know, because I don't have people to, to do all these services. And, and, you know, as our behavioral health service will always say, we will never have enough behavioral health providers to provide the level of care uh, that this country needs. So we have to be creative. We have to match the treatments available and the strategies available to places in which they can be most effective and with people who need them the most. So we decided to let the health systems choose how they were gonna implement all of those zero suicide approaches. And then we've worked with them over this time to measure what all of those, uh, uh, to, first of all, we had to chronicle all of those activities, and now, then we worked with them to figure out, well, what kind of data would you want to measure that? How would you like to decide whether or not your program was working? So we worked with them. And, and that's been ongoing for the first couple years of this, this project. Um, and then we also, the, then we looked at two streams of outcomes. And, and the first thing is we wanted to see, are people actually doing this the way that it was intended? So this is really more of a process outcome. We want our providers to work as a system, to work together. The way this is gonna be successful is not any one heroic clinician doing all the work possible and staying 24 seven in contact for, with people, doing every single task. I know many of you have done that out here. I know you, I know you have because I've talked, to you, talked with you about it. But that is not sustainable. That's not possible to do one-to-one -one treatment for an entire population. So how do we figure out how to tailor our services to provide the best care for people? Uh, and, and, but the first thing we have to do is work as a system, but we have to make sure we're doing the things that we intended to do. So once we design a structure, are we actually doing it? The second thing we need to do is measure whether it actually has an impact on our outcomes. So we're also, with the ability to measure over 9 million pay, people a year, we're able to actually measure whether these types of interventions actually by themselves or when bundled together with other interventions can actually reduce suicide attempts. Uh, and, and it will be one of the first ever that's been able to, to do that with this program uh, with zero suicide. We've included six healthcare systems and across all of those states. There are some caveats. All of the patients that we're following have at least some access to, to health insurance. We have to do that in order to measure the outcomes. So it's not, it, it, does ref, it doesn't get everyone, but it does, uh, it is the only way that we can actually capture all of the data that, that's possible to measure that many people. Uh, we do have a broad range of services, including primary care, outpatient specialty settings, inpatient, emergency departments, behavioral health specialties. I know that there are many healthcare systems uh, that only are parts of those. Pies. This system, these systems all have all of those services. So that is certainly an important thing to note. The other thing that's really important is that all of the systems have uh, created this data infrastructure that allows us to measure uh, all of the electronic health record and claims information for all of, their, all of the people that are involved, which allows us to do something very unique, which is to identify when suicide attempts happen and then to be able to, to learn from those. And, and that is not common among, uh, among most big data systems. But it's very important in allowing us to learn how to best do this at a large scale. So there are several components of zero suicide. There are operational component, components like clearly, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm a scientist, but 
I'm, I'm a human too, and I will tell you that you don't need any research to tell you that leadership is important. Uh, if there is no leadership, there will be no program. So I, we don't really need a lot of evidence to support that. It makes me feel dirty as a, as a, as a researcher, but you know, when I put my, my leadership hat on, uh, it's very clear that in order to get things done, we need committed and motivated meet leaders, like many of the people in this room. There are also a set of clinical components in zero suicide. We have to first identify people who are at risk. Second, we have to engage them in the treatment process. If we only identify people who are at risk and then, then turn our heads and let them you know, walk away, one of the problems that SAMHSA has identified is that people fall through the cracks. We lose so many people hopping in between places without any access to care, we need to engage them in the treatment process. Uh, and then we also need to provide suicide-specific treatment. You know, I think Dr. Joyner did a really good job this morning of showing you how suicide risk really can be thought of as its own separate condition. Imagine us treating any other illness. Let's, let's say you come in for a heart attack and we discharge you and say, well, all you need to do is uh, exercise and eat right. But we don't put the stent in. We don't do a bypass. We don't put you on any cholesterol medications. We don't do any of those things because we think that the root cause is this one thing. The reality is, is we have so much data now to say that that's not the case that actually only about half the people who die by suicide ever have a mental health condition. That conditions like traumatic brain injury, chronic pain, sleep disorders, significantly increase risk. And that the more conditions you have, the more at risk you are. And all the data that was presented this morning tells me we need to do treatment specifically for people for suicide risk and not treat depression and hope the risk goes away. That's what we've been doing for hundreds of years, is treating something else and hoping this thing disappears. It might, but it's very likely not going to happen. And so we need to tailor our treatments. Uh, we need to work on transitioning people and connecting them in between services, because that's where we lose people. That means following people with post-discharge contacts and carrying contacts and keep them, keeping people connected in between care. Uh, and we needed to measure all of this through our uh, electronic data system because that's how health systems measure quality. And in order for this to be feasible for systems, we had to use the same kinds of metrics that they wanted to use. We've also linked to state and official uh, mortality records. So what happened? After a lot of, lot of work, we came up with this chart, which depicts basically all of the different interventions that all of the systems, well, that some of the systems, or at least one of the systems, was, was implementing to address zero suicide. We have a manuscript that will have this all in it. It's under review right now. Obviously, I'm not allowed to tell you where. I don't know. Um, but all of this will be out there eventually. Uh, basically, there's a lot of different types. The, the, the thing that makes this so difficult is we did it this a certain way at Henry Ford, but everybody else is choosing to do it different ways. They're using different in, uh, identification tools. They're using different engagement methods, leveraging the resources that they have locally, but varying from the original model, which means we got to figure out whether all these different variations of the telephone game actually work. Uh, and that's why this is so important. So what is the basic structure of what we did? So basically, it starts with some sort of screening for identification of people who are at risk for suicide, a detailed risk assessment, a safety plan, and then connection to some sort of treatment plan, treatment approach, either psychotherapy, uh, some type of either and or. So a range of multiple of these or just one of all of the options up on the screen. The idea is, if possible, to avoid sending everyone to the hospital. Uh, but for people who are at the very highest risk, to make sure that there is uh, a place available. 
We have a series of metrics that were developed in con collaboration with our healthcare systems partner partners. Obviously, Henry Ford, I'm representing Henry Ford, but I also need to say thank you to the Kaiser Permanente and all of their regions for agreeing to share all of these metrics. Uh, it's a bit risky for healthcare systems to be bold and say, hey, we're, we're working, we got a problem, we need to do something about our suicide and to, to be able to declare these are the things we're gonna measure ourselves on before we even have the outcomes. Here's some of the initial data. So some of the systems have started to implement uh, Columbia screening after a positive PHQ-9 uh, that identified people at a uh, Columbia assessment after people were identified as being positive for increased risk on the, on the ninth item of the PHQ-9. Our self-harm incidence rate, this is all the new suicide attempts that have happened. Now, this is baseline, so most of this is the time period before people started implementing. You do see, though, that a couple of the systems have slowly started to trend downwards in their suicide attempt rates. I don't know what that means. And I just want to clarify that that does not necessarily mean that this is making a difference, but it does provide me uh, with some, some excitement and some potential uh, enthusiasm for the fact that maybe something is happening. Um, and the, the lines that are starting to trend down were the systems that started to do some of this stuff first. And that's very good news. Uh, it's been really hard to figure out how to connect people to outpatient services. And uh, my friend here, Jen, will, uh, who leads our ED service, will, will attest to the fact that connecting people to service after an inpatient or emergency room uh, stay is very difficult. And yet these uh, data represent uh, probably way better than average across the nation of meeting, having a follow-up visit within seven days after discharge. Um, so what were some of the challenges that we identified? Clearly we have to continue to measure this for another couple years. We still have two and a half more years and now is the time uh, moving forward when we're going to anticipate seeing whether or not any of these things made, actually made a difference at the population level implemented by real world clinicians with real world patients in real world healthcare systems every single day in various settings. But what's been challenging so far? So we have to try and harmonize or figure out what counts as being, as, as, and, and what versions of things to do. Everyone's sort of going their own path. People have all agreed that we should use the same tool to screen the PHQ-9, but not everybody is using the Columbia. Some people have their own assessment tools and other people are using different, you know, uh, a variety. Uh, Deciding when we should be able to have availability of, out, of visits after, um, after a, a, a follow-up visit, after uh, an initial identification of someone who's at risk. That's a difficult challenge because every system has different uh, amount of resources. Uh, and so I don't have a clear answer yet, but we can certainly describe the scope of how people made those decisions. And then deciding on the care pathway. That care pathway looks different in the emergency room, in behavioral health, in primary care, and in the inpatient setting. It looks different across each of our organizations. But we did come to some consensus on a specific care pathway that I showed you earlier that tends to be the common theme across all of those. We've had challenges with measuring suicide attempts, which I think is a, is a mild challenge for us, but would be a major challenge for a lot of people across the country. Uh, because we don't have the data available to funnel that kind of information. Uh, how do we measure safety plans? Sure, we can easily measure whether or not those are done. We have templates created in the EHR. I can't measure how, how well they are done, though. Uh, is just giving someone a piece of paper and asking them to fill out a safety plan the same thing as sitting side by side with them and going through a patient-driven uh, intervention, the same thing? It sure is not. Uh, so we have an additional set of funding that allows us to uh, measure quality using the data that we have. 
And then examining how people are using different types of suicide specific treatment is not well documented in the electronic health record system. Sure, I know that we have DBT services available, but who is actually getting those services not well documented. So the next steps are developing research metrics uh, or continuing to develop more metrics uh, to follow and to continue to measure these outcomes. Uh, we also have a grant that was additionally funded to, to measure whether these changes in opioid prescribing across the country are making any impact on the suicide attempt rates, uh, and then also kind of trying to figure out how to better measure the quality of safety plans. All of that is kind of coming in the next few years. So I just want to say that we've made immense, challenge, uh, immense uh, progress in this field. Twenty years ago, we knew nothing. Literally, in fact, the, 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 the original stra national strategy for suicide prevention included no uh, acknowledgement that any suicide prevention activities needed to be affiliated with healthcare systems. We are now doing wide scale implementation across the country in many places where people are recognizing that we need to start doing this. But we have a long way to go. Most people are in their infancy stages and they're really trying to figure out how to do this right. And we have to figure out whether we're reaching all the right people. Because more, we need to also build on campaigns like the one that Jody described earlier that reach out into the community to people who don't ever even get into healthcare. But we really need to stretch beyond behavioral health. Only about a third of people who die by suicide ever get to behavioral health services. We can no longer only focus on people who are in behavioral health services. Our suicide rate in this country has gone up 33% in the last 20 years, and only a third of people get to behavioral health. So if we provided perfect care in only specialty settings, we will never, ever improve our suicide rate in this country. So there are a lot of things that we can do. A lot of interventions that, are, uh, that we can implement, but we have to reach greater distances. We have to touch more people, and we have to do that in settings that we haven't done before. Uh, so I want to say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you to the conference organizers, and uh, ask if there are any questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. So. <laughs> My concern as being a provider in a non-behavioral health setting, part of our issue that we keep talking about is there's actually a lack of access. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, isn't part of our reason why people are not receiving care or that we have to think about outside of behavioral health is because people can't actually get into behavioral yeah. health. I, I, that, is, that is the biggest and I mentioned earlier that you know, we have such an incredible lack of access across the nation. Uh, it is a major problem. We need to figure that out. One of the innovative things that uh, we've done at Henry Ford in primary care is, uh, is a, a pretty innovative uh, telemedicine-based uh, behavioral health integration approach that pushes out into primary care locations and, and uh, is able to, from one centralized place, access all of our different settings. So psychotherapy happening right in a primary care off doctor's office for people who don't want to go to behavioral health, that that's helps some with the stigma. It doesn't help with the provider access. We need to think about new ways of engaging people uh, in the community to provide different types of services. But it is not okay uh, to do the same things that we've been doing. And we have to figure out a way to work upstream on prevention rather than waiting until there's a crisis, which is why there's such a big problem in the emergency room, and then we have all these resources going to, pre to prevent the second suicide attempt rather than spending a bunch of our resources upstream to pri try and prevent all of the first ones from ever happening. So I really appreciate, Jen, that comment, because I, I think that that speaks to how we really need to think about reorganizing our healthcare systems and being creative about the way that we use our services. Any, any, I know that we're bumping up the time here, but 
Hi, um, so I'm in private practice at Wilmworth. Um, and we find often since the mental health parity that they're making mental health care access easier to people with insurance per se because the deductibles are going up instead. Um, so I guess what my question probably would be is how are we maybe finding ways hopefully to address insurance companies so that they maybe will allow for more providers to provide care because that's where we're running into. They argue with licensure types. Um, in various different situations, you know, diagnosis codes, whatnot. So I'm just curious if there's anything that you know about that portion of things. Yeah, in fact, all of these systems have affiliated insurance plans. Uh, I can tell you that there have been many national meetings uh, with insurance companies uh, talking about ways to better cover these services. There have been, there's been very slow progress, uh, but but people are starting to think about it. Um, I know that Health Partners in Minnesota has started to implement uh, you know, machine learning algorithms in their, in their data to try and identify people who may be at the highest risk and are supporting health systems by also offering additional care resources right through the insurance plan to connect people to services. I know that um, some of the big insurance companies are starting to uh, pay for some of the services that we've talked about. There are now some codes that we can use through CMS uh, to, to bill for some of our extended services out in, uh, out in um, primary care settings. That never used to be the case. So some of this is making progress. Um, we really need a restructure of the system to do a, a full comprehensive job, but um, we, I think, are making pretty substantial progress compared to where we were 20 years ago. Uh, so I appreciate that comment, and uh, as I said at the beginning, um, we've made a lot of progress, but we have really a long way to go. Uh, I applaud people in this room for, for being the champions that are continuing to push that forward. So the, the difficult thing, too, that, that um, you mentioned is, is kind of not only with people with insurance, but also people without insurance, and uh, how do we provide care for them? or people with Medicaid who have to bounce in between a hospital and a CMH and organizing all of that care when people are, are between the cracks. Uh, that absolutely needs to be addressed. And I think there are people that are trying to work on different solutions.